Let us have a small look at this min hash idea and uh, mesh distances that we are going to compute in this course. And I have to say that this, um, this idea of min hashing is really one of the big new ideas, I would say, in, in genomics in general. So this is really something that is worth learning a little bit about. KMERS. And Jacquard index is the first thing I will have to uh, talk about because Jacquard index is, uh, is very uh, central here. Uh, the mesh distance between genomes, let's see how this is defined actually. And then the min hash idea, which is actually how we compute this uh, Jacquard index actually, which is part of the mesh distance formula. Uh, I will also mention briefly the extension to read sets because uh, we start out by comparing genomes. That's, we, uh, that's sort of the setting that we start out with, but, but exactly the same idea can be used for any sets really. It doesn't have to be genomes. So read sets can also be, it's, it's sort of meaningful to compute a mesh distance between read sets uh, as well. And uh, in, in that respect, the idea is the same, except for one thing, which is this bloom filtering that I will just briefly mention. And here is the original paper. Have a look at this one. And it's actually a good idea to have a look at this one before you listen to my lecture here, because I will use stuff from that, from that uh, publication. I will use their same notation. You will recognize some formulas and stuff. And then you listen to my talk here, and then you can read it again to see if you, uh, things become more clear. <clears throat> so the setting, we have two genomes, G, G1 and G2, right? And these have some common ancestor. So we assume that these two genomes are actually quite similar, right? Uh, and I can say that right away, that this mesh distance is actually only meaningful to compare rather similar genomes. If the genomes are very, very different from each other, you can still compute a mesh distance, but it will be very unreliable and, and not very useful. So this is for comparing closely related genomes, you could say, but it, 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 yeah, at least fairly close, right? <coughs> we also assume here now that both the genomes are of the same size. And this is not really a requirement. You can see my footnote here. Uh, they can easily be of different size. The only reason we have a, a common N here now is to make things simpler in the formulas and so on. And since I already said that these two genomes should be rather similar, it also implies that they have rather same size, right? So, so so this is not a very harsh restriction, you could say, right? So we can imagine this is how they are related, right? Two genomes, and they have some common ancestor fairly recently then, right? So they haven't, they haven't diverged a lot. From each of these genomes, we now collect k-mers, right? Of length k, which is actually <laughs> unnecessary to say, right? Because it, it, it lies in the phrase k mers that they are of length k. So we now, call, uh, and this we have done, right? We have done this in, if you go back to module three, we collected k mers from genomes using the Jellyfish software. So we can now easily collect k mers from both these genomes. <coughs> and uh, I also mentioned this one because this is something you see in the paper. The alphabet is denoted uh, capital sigma here, and in our case, it's the DNA alphabet. But it could have been amino acids as well. And then the size of the alphabet, which is this, right, the, the absolute value of sigma, that's four, right? Because it's four letters. So the, I only mentioned this because this is something you see in the paper. And here is a quote from the paper. For nucleotide sequences, MASH uses canonical k mers by default to allow strand neutral comparisons, right? So remember this. 
Uh, and we have we know what canonical k-mers are, right? Go back to module three if you don't remember. So we collect the canonical k-mers from each uh, genome. Or actually, yeah, we will see how we do this. But think of it in this way, right? So jacquard index. What is the jacquard index? It's actually a quite simple uh, index or measure. And it measures the similarity between two sets. <coughs> so think of A and B as two sets. And this can be sets containing all kinds of elements, right? It doesn't have to be k-mers like we are looking at in this context. It could have been numbers, it could be names, it could be anything, right? So this is a very, very general idea. And what is the jacket index? It is the size of the intersection Right? This is the intersection, and, and these uh, absolute values indicate the size of, the, of this set divided by the size of the union. So what does a jacquard index sort of measure? Here I have one set A, right? Indicated as a, as a ellipsis here. And then if the set B is similar over here, we see they have an intersection here. This is the intersection, right? They overlap. Some elements of A are also elements of B. But rather, uh, many elements in A are unique to A, and also many elements in B are unique to B. But they have something in common here. And this means, uh, and, and this, uh, this the numerator here, the size of the intersection, that's the area here, right? The intersection area. While this union is the total area. If you if you have both the yellow and the blue here. So that's a much bigger area, right? So here we can see that the jacquard index is like 0.1 because this area here is like 10% of the total area. Over here we have the same set or some other sets that I call A and B and this time they overlap a lot, right? So here the intersection is quite big and the union is actually smaller, right? And this means the jacket index is now much bigger because now the uh, numerator here is quite big and almost as big as the, as the denominator, right? And you can see that if the jacket index is zero, it means the sets are not overlapping at all. There is no intersection and they are completely unique sets. Or on the other end of the scale, if the jacket index is a one, it means the intersection is actually the same as the union and the two sets are identical to each other. So the bigger jacket index, the more similar the sets are. We can now uh, think of k-mers, the set of k-mers as these sets, right? We have collected number of k-mers from one genome, a number of k-mers from the other genome, and then we can compute the jacquard index based on how many k-mers they have in common. So collect all the distinct canonical k-mers from both genomes, and we assume this is n, right? Because <coughs> if k is large, and this is also something we saw in module three, if you have a rather long k-mer, it's very unlikely that you see it twice, in, 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 at least in a random genome, in a, bi in a biological genome, there are some k-mers who will be seen twice, but they are not very many, right? They, they are the repeated regions and they, are, they span just a smallish part of the genome. So this is almost always true, right? If, we, if you have a genome of so size n, then you have approximately n unique k-mers, given that k is a little bit large, right? And then W indicates the number of k-mers that are common between these two genomes. That is what is meant by identical here. I mean, you collect k-mers from G1, collect k-mers from G2, and then you see that W k-mers are shared between these two genomes. The total number of k-mers is this one, 2n minus W, because you count all the n k-mers in the one set plus all the n k-mers in the other set, that's 2n, 
And then you have counted the intersection twice, right? So you have to subtract one times the intersection to get that also once. That's the size of the union. So actually the Jacquard index is this, right? The size of the intersection, W, divided by the size of the union here, 2n minus W. Remember this formula here. We will use it in two slides. And also, this is something we could have done by using jellyfish, like we did in module three. We could have collected all the k-mers from one genome, all the k-mers from the other, and start comparing them, right? So in theory, we know how to do this, compute the Jacquard index between two genomes. Mesh distance, what is mesh distance? Well, then we have to uh, recapitulate from introductory bioinformatics, what is an evolutionary distance? What is an evol evolutionary distance? It's defined as the expected number of mutations per position in the genome, per position, right? Expected number of mutations per position. Yeah, go back to bin 210 to repeat this if you don't uh, remember. We also have uh, approximate evolutionary distance if we use the what is called the ROM or uh, model or the P distance, because this, this expected number of mutations is, is impossible to actually observe. This is impossible to observe, but this is sort of what we try to compute, right? What we actually observe is the number of differences. So, uh, so the raw estimate you can see of this true evolutionary distance is this p distance that we also call it. Expected number of differences per position. And notice the uh, number of mutations and number of distances is not the same because you can have mutated back and forth several times. Right? The same difference can have been changed over and over again. So the number of mutations is always bigger than the number of distances differences that we now observe. So if we have a raw distance d, it's the same as saying that the probability is d that these two genomes differ in one given position. Right? You, you sort of pick one. Remember, these two genomes come from a common ancestor. You pick one position on that common ancestor, and then you locate that same position on g1 and the same position at G2, and D is then the probability that they differ. So D is usually a very small value, right? Or, or it's, it's much closer to zero than to one, right? The probability is always between zero and one, but this is close to zero or like 1% or 10% or something in that range, right? Not 90%, it's always low. Of course, if G1 and G2 are wildly different genomes, right? If this is a bacterium and this is human, then D is big. But then we are not, these cases we are not interested in, right? It has to be fairly closely related genomes. And then D is always sort of smallish. The expected number of differences in a K mare is then just K times D. Right, because D is the probability of a difference at each position. And in the K-mer, there are K positions. So the expected number of differences in the K-mer must be just K times this probability. And then in this paper, they use a Poisson model, saying that the number of differing positions in k if you collect the k from this uh, G1 and G2 at the same sort of uh, region of G1 and G2, the, the number of differing positions in this k mer is Poisson with parameter lambda, which is actually k times d. And uh, why is not this a binomial? Well, actually it is. It, this is actually a binomial variable. This is coin flipping, right? You flip the coin k times, and each time you flip the coin, the probability of head is D, right? The probability of difference. How many differences will you see after flipping the coin K times? But uh, if you go back to module three, we also talked about this relation between 
binomial variables and Poisson variables. And very often we use the Poisson as an approximation to the binomial because it uh, results in simpler mathematics. So it's purely convenience. And uh, if you replaced in the following now, if you replaced all the uh, Poisson formulas with the binomial formulas, you will uh, see that, uh, or if, if you try to compute something, you will see you get the same results, at least to the first five decimals or something like that. So it's a very close approximation. So here is the, uh, here is the actually the formula, the, the probability mass function, as we say, for the Poisson distribution, right? The probability of m differences, if it's a Poisson variable, it follows this formula here. So you can see the lambda is in here to the power of m, and then it's the exponential function here, and then it's m faculty in the denominator here. <clears throat> so this is taken directly from the textbook in statistics. Then we see that if we now compute the probability of m equals zero, plug in m equals zero in this formula here, and your results in this very simple here, only e exponential of the minus lambda, and then we just replace lambda with kde over here, so we have this simple expression. This is the probability of having zero differences, right? The probability of having no differences, m equals zero, right? Having no differences, if we collect a k mer from G1 and the same k mer sort of, or k mer from the exact same position in G2, this is the probability that these two k mers are identical. And we can see it depends on this d, right? The distance. So if the distance is small between the two genomes, this probability is high. But if the distance is big between the genomes, this probability uh, is small. And that sounds reasonable, right? The more distantly related the genomes are, the less likely it is that two k coming from the same region is the same. Something may have, uh, if they are far from each other, th things have mutated, right? So the k starts to not be identical. So the k with no differing positions they are the ones who are identical. And we know that if we, we call this W, right? At least what we observe is W, right? These are the number of K-mers who are identical. And now we know that expected number of such K-mers must be the probability of, of this happening times the number of K-mers we have. So again, this is like coin flipping, but now here's the probability of having no difference. And if you uh, multiply this with how many k-mers you have, then you have approximately what you observe number of identical k-mers, k-mers without differences. So notice there is an approximation here because this expected value is never exactly what you observe, right? <clears throat> Be, uh, because this uh, there is a variance here right but uh, so so this is the peak right this is the where the distribution has its peak and this is what we observe which is always nearby the peak but it could be a little bit above or a little bit below so that's why we have this approximate here but it's a quite a good approximation usually at least for big uh, big n here and then we can just rearrange this a little bit to get this one. We just divide by n on both sides, you can see that. So the reason I do that is that this exact formula is what you find in the paper. So remember this one as well. And now <clears throat> we combine from the previous two slides. We have the formula for the Jacquard index two slides ago and the formula from the previous slide here. And now we just solve for d. What you actually do is you solve this one for W first. So you get an expression for W expressed as a, uh, depending on J and N, right? And then you just plug that in for W here and solve for D. And then you get this formula here. <clears throat> 
And again, notice there is an approximate here because of the approximate here. So the, the, the evolutionary distance between the two genomes can be described in here like this, depending on the K, which is the size of the k mirrors, and the JACAD index. Can you see that? But no W. W is no longer in here. And now the mesh distance is defined as actually this right hand side here. That's this is the mesh distance. And we can see that it's an approximate to the evolutionary distance, right? But it's not exactly the same thing. But this is an approximate to the uh, evolutionary, raw evolutionary distance. So why 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 do we want the formula like this? Why why would we get rid of this W, for instance? Uh, we need now to compute this jacquard index, right? Because that's part of the formula here. This one is we know, right? That's the size of our k-mers. But this jacquard index we don't know. Uh, <coughs> wouldn't it be how easier have been easier to compute this W? Well, in, in a sense, it's easier, but now we turn our sort of attention to speed. How can we compute this mesh distance in the fastest possible way? And this is really where this idea is shining, I would say. The min hash idea. <clears throat> and this is an idea that comes from, actually from one of the internet search engines that has which is no longer with us, I think, but it was once before Google <laughs> stole the whole market. Uh, this was one of the search engines that spawned this idea here. So <clears throat> the idea is to not compare all the cameras from G1 to all the cameras of G2, because that's what we need to do to compute this W, right? We need to first collect all the cameras from one genome, collect all the cameras from the second genome, and then start to compare every pair of them. And this is horrible, right? If you have if you have a million cameras from the first one and a million from the second one, then you have a million times million comparisons. And this will take a long time to do on a even on a fast computer. <clears throat> point is that the jacquard index can be estimated very well by looking at subsets of k-mers. We don't need to compare all k-mers in order to compute this jacquard index. And we, uh, the question is which subsets to look at. And this is perhaps not uh, obvious at once, but it's not uh, very difficult to sort of get this idea once you see it. Should we sample at random from both genomes? No, this turns out to be really a silly idea to do. And I think I will try to demonstrate it shortly, why this doesn't work at all. It, 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 it works only if the random sample is almost the size of the two genomes. And then you haven't really, if you have a subset which is almost as big as the set itself, then no time has been saved, right? The much better idea goes like this. Sort all the k-mers, for instance, alphabetically. Sort them alphabetically, and then only compare the S first k-mers from both genomes. So you sort all the k-mers in both genomes first, and then you compare only the S, the subset of size S, right? The S first k-mers from both genomes. And and if these two gen gen genomes are very similar to each other, the first k-mers after sorting will also be very similar to each other. Imagine the two genomes are identical. Then, of course, the k-mers you have after sorting in one genome is exactly the same k-mers you have as sorting in the second genome. The sorting of all the k-mers, however, is sort of slow. So there is uh, still some some um, some way to, uh, to to optimize this. But before we actually go to to um, to seeing how this min hashing is working, 
I want to show you an example in, in R, just uh, the difference between these two ideas here of sampling at random and, and sorting first. So I prepared a small script here in R. And uh, <clears throat> let me just briefly uh, tell you what it does. Uh, I, draw, uh, uh, I sample at random a set A consisting of a thousand integers from one up to 100,000. So it's just randomly collect uh, samples at random, these numbers, thousand of them. And then I, I make a set B, which is also thousand uh, uh, numbers, but I make sure that the first 200 values in A are also in B so that they have some overlap here. So now we have some overlap, right? Guaranteed. And then I compute the jacket index straightforward using both uh, the full set A and the full set B. So this is sort of the, the big job that we are trying to avoid, but this gives us the exact jacket index. So if I run this one here, you can see I have a thousand numbers down here, and then I run this one here. I have another thousand values here and they are not in the same order, right? So they are in completely random ordering. And then I compute the jacket index by taking the size of the intersection, dividing by the size of the union. And you can see in this case, it's 0.11 something, 11%, yeah. right? Jacket index. So they have some overlap, right? The intersection is like 200. And since each of them are approximately thousand, or each of them are exactly thousand long, uh, the sets are have size one thousand. So you have two hundred divided by. Yeah, the union is a little bit less than two thousand though, because they share this two hundred, right? So that's why the jacketing is a little bit more than ten percent. If we now sample at random a subset from A, right, a capital A, and I call this lowercase a. Just sample at random 100, 100 of the values, 10% of the set, and the same for b, and then we compute the jacket index. Look at it down here. Look at it. It's very, very small, right? It's only a tenth of the actual jacket value. And if I do it again, I can sample again, uh, get slightly different values, but this jacket value is still very much too small. Because the, the probability of sampling, when you sample at random, just a few numbers from each set, it's very unlikely that you sample something which is in the intersection, right? And here it was dramatically small. So you can repeat this over and over again and see it will never be close to the true value of 0.11. However, if you sub, uh, sort the subsamples and then sample 100, a and B, and then you can look at the uh, jacket index. Look at this, it's much closer. And we can do it again. So now, uh, and, and it's the same because there is no longer a random sample, right? We sort, so each time we sort, we get exactly the same values. So if you want to repeat it, you have to sort of repeat the whole uh, running of the sets, and then we can, completely different values, whoops. Sort A, sort B, and then the uh, intersection here. Yeah, so now it was a little bit less than, than 0.11, but it's around that value, right? So this illustrates how, how much closer you get to the true jacket index by doing it this way, compared to random sampling. <clears throat> so the idea uh, that makes this uh, sp uh, sp um, different from what we actually saw by uh, sorting is the use of hash function, the min hash idea. A hash table, what is a hash table? A hash table is actually a data structure made for fast lookup. If you uh, uh, imagine you want to store uh, the phone numbers, this is a typical example. You have a name, and for each name you have associated a phone number, right? And then uh, you want to look up the phone number given a name, right? 
I give you a name and you want to make a fast lookup. What is the phone number of this person, right? Uh, then you typically have uh, the keys that we call. That's the that's the sort of information that you have, the name. And then you store the phone numbers in an array, in, in a vector. Think of it as a vector, right? The point is that we now have what we call hash function that takes the text, the name, or it could be any text, takes a text, and for each text, each unique text, it produces a unique number. And this number is now exactly the row in the vector where you have stored the phone number for this person, right? So uh, each new name gets a new number from this hash function. And, it, and, and, and if the same name appears two times, it also gets the same number both times. So it's not a random number. This number is sort of computed from the letters here in some uh, smart way. Uh, and exactly what this hash, how this hash function is built is not something we're concerned about now. Um, making good hash functions is really an art. But uh, uh, we just uh, think of it as some function that is given to us that for each new text we, we put into the function, it returns back to us a number, which is a row in, in, a, in a vector, right? The, uh, uh, and this makes lookup extremely fast, right? You don't have to start uh, searching through this vector. You can go directly to the position where you have the phone number. So each object, in our case, a K-mer, so replace the names here with k -mers. They are also text, right? Each k is converted to an integer by a hash function. That's what we see here. And then, <clears throat> Uh, the object is stored, or the information about the ob object is stored in cell i in this array, right? The integer that we give. So this integer we get is an index, right? It's an index indicating which element in this vector we should now look into. So this makes the lookup extremely fast. So this in address i is what we call the hash. So think of it just as a number. A hash is just a number an index, an integer, right? And each new text here will get a new hash value. And such hash function, in order to make this lookup really fast, this must be really fast functions. So they don't sort of uh, spend much time computing this number given the text. Uh, the, the cost by doing hashing is that you're not guaranteed that this hash function will with will uh, use every row in this vector. So if you store the phone numbers of a thousand persons, you need a vector of more than thousand elements because some rows here will not be made use of. Uh, and that's sort of the cost of making this hash function fast. Yeah. You should take a course in algorithms and data structures to really get an idea of what hashing is all about. But hash tables or hashing, is a technique we use for very fast lookup. So this is capital O1 algorithm, the fastest you can ever have, right? Because once you have the name of the person, it takes one lookup to find the phone number. Right? There is no searching through the vector. So <clears throat> this mean hash is now used to sort the k-mers. Uh, in the mean hash, we use the hash value. We don't sort them alphabetically. I use, the, I, I only use that as, a, that as an example of how to sort, but we can just as well use the hash values to sort the k -mers. And those are extremely fast computed, right? Because these hash functions are made for super fast computation. So for each new k -mer, zap, you have the, the value of it, the hash value, and then you just sort the k -mers. And then we just store the S smallest, or we could have stored the largest, it doesn't matter. 
hashes. And that's what's called a bottom sketch then, if you saw the smallest hashes, right? You just have to choose one or the other end. It's like sorting alphabetically, right? Do you want, after sorting, do you look at the first S elements or the last S element? Doesn't matter. So a sketch is now a subset of hashes and we decide the size of it, right? The S. And we will do some sketching in this course now. And then they say here in, in the paper that for a sketch of size S and a genome size N, a bottom sketch can be efficiently computed in capital O N log S time by maintaining a sorted list of size S and updating the current sketch. So actually you start, when you start collecting the k-mers, right? The first, like, if, let's say we have set S equal to thousand. We want to store the thousand smallest hashes. Okay, then the first thousand k-mers will all be stored in, in, in our sketch initially, right? But then as you start to look at the thousand and first, thousand and second, thousand and third, and so on, you just replace, if, if, if the new hashes are smaller than the biggest of the thousand already stored hashes, then you just replace that, right? So that the, the thousand smallest hashes are found. So you just have to, you have to go through all the N k-mers and then uh, a little bit more than that. And it also says that the further you go, come into the set, you can, you can imagine you start by the first thousand k-mers, okay, so all of them will be stored in a hash. But then once you have collected like a million k-mers, you have probably found almost all the smallest ones, right? So only a few of the last ones will be uh, will replace some of the already found ones. So actually, it turns out that this is almost linear in the uh, O uh, capital O of n, nearly linear. You can plot and and see that uh, this this term here doesn't contribute with almost anything. So. It takes the time, the time it takes grows linearly by the size of the genome or the two genomes then. So if you double the size of the genomes, this double the time it takes. And that's uh, much faster, right? Uh, compared to if you start to compare all, all the k-mers to each other, then it's capital O of n squared, right? This is capital O of n super much faster. So here's a drawing from the paper. <clears throat> so here you can imagine we have the blue and the red genome, <laughs> right? We collect the k-mers and then we run them through this hash function. And here is the set of hashes from the blue genome. And here's the set of hashes from the red genome. And then <clears throat> from the blue genome, we collect uh, the five smallest hashes, these are the filled dots here. And from the red genome B, we also collect the five smallest hashes, which are filled dots here. And then uh, once we have all the smallest hashes here and all the smallest hashes here, we start to compute the five smallest hashes among these two sets of hashes. And those are the five with the crosses on, right? Crosses on here. So the, f the five, so this is in the middle here, the, the five smallest values, if you collect all these and all these. And then you will see that this 82 is member of both, right? Sides. And that's the one you see here. It's in the intersection, right? The hash 82 is here. And then we can, from this uh, picture here now, infer that the jacquard index here is 0.20, 0 0.20, because there are five hashes, uh, that's sort of the union, right? And the intersection is one, one out of five, 0 0.2. So one out of one out of the five with crosses is in the intersection. And you can see that if we had collected all the k-mers, it is actually in, 
of course this drawing is made sort of perfect so if you collected all the cameras in the intersection here you will see that uh, uh, this is also one out of these five right so this is how the <clears throat> is approximated so uh, few words about sketching read sets in the end, because up to now we looked at genomes, right? But this idea can also be used for directly from the read sets. You don't need to assemble the genomes, because the k-mers we get from the genomes should be the same k-mers you get from the reads. Can you see that? Only you see the k-mers over and over again in the reads, but they are the same k-mers. And what we need to do when we, uh, when we consider reads instead of a genome is that we have to filter out k-mers with low frequency. And we know why, right? If you go back to module number three, you will see we talked about this there. Because k-mers should appear around k-mer coverage number of times. Right? So if you k-mer coverage of, let's say, 50, then k-mers that occur only once or twice they are probably error-prone k-mers. They have some sequencing error in them. And these k-mers we should, of course, not collect. We don't want to collect the k-mers with errors in them. So that's why we filter out k-mers with a low frequency. And this only applies to read sets, because when you look at genomes, genomes, right, assembled genomes, then all k-mers would have low frequency. Think of that. So you can't use this for genomes because then you throw away everything. Well, a bloom filter is used to quickly eliminate the cameras occurring less than C times. So that's uh, again a technique to speed up things. And this limit C is set by the user and by default is one, so you don't really throw away anything. And this is fine when you look at genomes, as I said, then you have to use this value one. Otherwise you end up with almost nothing only the repeated regions will contribute with something. That's silly. But for read sets, this is sensible. Bloom filter, I will not talk very much about it uh, because uh, uh, there is actually a movie here by Rob Edwards. We have seen some of his films uh, before. So I just urge you to, to look at this uh, uh, YouTube video here and hear what Rob Edwards has to say about bloom filters. The point is that this is, uh, this is a very quick way of eliminating low frequency cameras, you could say. But uh, so I, I think that for, for our course, we don't want to dig very deep into this technical stuff. We only need to understand why it's a good idea to do this. But actually, exactly how it's done, it's for those of you who are curious, have a look at this video. Well, let's see if we can install the GG3 package on Orion. And that turns out to be quite a hassle these days because the 404 version of R that we have been using throughout this uh, course, uh, it does the GG3 package no longer installs properly on that version. It did uh, in uh, two months ago. But during this fall, uh, they have updated the package on Bioconductor in such a way that it doesn't install properly on this older version of R. You have to use the newest version of R, it turns out. And this is actually a bug, I would say, from the producers of this R package. But this is what we have to, uh, to live with when, when trying to use this package. We will still try to use it. Uh, then why don't we just migrate to 4.1.0 version? Yeah, that would be the sensible thing to do, right? But there is another problem, namely that the R Studio version that we are running on R Orion these days is not really compatible with this version of R. Uh, when you start plotting with this version of R in the current version of R Studio that we have on Orion, it doesn't really work. It will not show you the plots. Yeah, there is something strange there. I have told the IT people, and it might, might be that we get a new version of R Studio now, 
and then everything I tell you here is almost everything is is no longer value. Then we just start using the newest version of R and everything is fine, right? But let me see how we can sort of possibly get around this. So what I need to do now, I have logged in here and I start now the newest version of R, 4.1.0. Click on this button. So you start R Studio with the newest version of R. Yeah, and it terminates here. So up to here, it should be sort of fine. Then I would go to my packages tab here and update my packages because now the packages here have been installed for our version 404. Now I want to update them so that they are uh, working for 410. And um, yeah, some on, only some needed updating here. I select them all and I install updates. So this should be sort of straightforward. Uh, the number of packages you need to uh, update will vary a little bit perhaps. But this should be straightforward, right? It will take some time though. So I might skip that here now. Okay, so here I have everything installed. And notice this warning message here. This is exactly the problem I told you about. Our graphics engine version 14 is not supported by this version of RStudio. So let's hope we get a newer version of RStudio and then we can actually stop here and or then, then we can continue using this R uh, version. But uh, the next thing I want to do now is to just restart R quit session and start a new one. I find this is a good idea to you to do quite frequently, especially after you have updated or installed R packages and stuff. Restart R like that. Now we should install the GG3 package and then we have to go to the bioconductor. It's not on the crown, so you cannot go in here and use the common way of installing a package. We have to do it in uh, in the procedure that you find here at Bioconductor. And then I just search for GG3. And I will probably find it here, yes. And then I go down to this gray field here, installation. How do you do it? Well, you copy these two lines of code. This one first. And paste it into the console window here. The first one is just installing a small package called BIOS C Manager, and again, we have this warning here, right? That R Studio is not compatible with this version of R. Then I go back here and I install this particular package. Copy this code, and I go back to my console window again and paste it in here. Install GG3. So let's hope this goes well now. Okay, so this looks fine. I can't see any error messages here at the end. <clears throat> so apparently the GG3 package installed fine. And if I uh, update now my packages tab here, I should see it on my list. If I scroll down, yeah, there it is, GG3. So let me just load it. I just click on here or I type library GG3 to see if it loads. Yeah, it looks fine. Then I click on this uh, name to, to get to the, to the home the help page for, for this package. And here are some user guides and stuff. I click on this one to have a look at it. And there's usually some examples here that you can, uh, yeah, okay. This was uh, Need help, GG3 homepage. Okay, so you can go to the homepage here to, to, to see how you can actually uh, get started. But the problem is now, the problem is now that the R Studio is not compatible with this R version, right? So if we try to plot something here now, it will not appear in the plots window. I have tried, at least the, the, this is how it works this week for me. It will not appear here. It will just create a PDF fi a file, an empty PDF file. So there is something seriously wrong, right? By using R410 
together with this version of RStudio. So how, what, what on earth do we do? Well, I have found that it could be, we can get around it in this way. Now I just, yeah, I can restart R again. I always try to remember to do that once I install the package. <clears throat> but what I actually need to do is to restart the whole job. So I just kill the window here. I get back here and I go to File, Hub Control Menu and stop my server, right? You may need to click twice on that button to make it work. And then you should really kill all the windows here, right? Like this, and then restart <clears throat> from scratch, Jupyter Hub. And this may, sometimes you get an error message here because the old server hasn't really died yet. It could be a good idea to just wait a minute or two before you come in here again. And then I start again, a new server, new session. And now I try to start the old 404 version again. I go back to the 404 version, right? Where R is compatible with RStudio. But note this, as soon as the IT people manage to update the RStudio, we may not need that. We can, we can continue using this newest version. But as long as they haven't, they, ha they are busy people, right? They, are, they don't have time to do it. I have, have told them, but let's see if this is still doable. Okay, so I, I installed, uh, or we installed the GGT package. I restarted and uh, using R404 version. Now let's see if we can load the, this um, GG3 package here, library gg3. Well, I got this error. It says that I, what does it say? Package and then it says failed, yeah. There is no package called patchwork. And also there is a warning that GG3 was installed under a new version of R. Yeah, that, that's something we must expect, these warnings now because we now updated all packages to 4.1 version of R. And then we went back to using an older version of, one, of, of R. But um, the warnings we can ignore, but errors we cannot. So I will have to try to install this patchwork. What is this? Let's see. If I go here, let's hope it's on Cran. Install packages on, from Cran. And then we start typing patch. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's so good. Let's try to install that one and see if this helps. If it was a bioconductor package, it should have been installed. It's also, uh, it's not a good sign when you need to reinstall a package. I mean, when installing the GG3 package, this should also have been installed as a dependency. Okay. That was a small and quick one. Let's see if this uh, helps. Yeah, that looks like uh, it, it helped. So now I have loaded the GG3 package. No errors here. I get this warning still, but uh, I, ha I can live with these warnings. As long as that's all the problems I get, I am happy to to accept that. So over here, I actually copied some code. Uh, and from where? Well, I went into this GG3. If you if you low, if you click on its name here in the packages uh, tab, you get to the help uh, page for the package. And usually there are some vignettes as they are called here. You can click on those and follow this link. Uh, Sadly, this package vignette is horrible, I have to say. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you have to go through this link actually to find something. And here you can see, uh, yeah, this is, not, this is not really very good. And down here you can see 
phylogenetic tree, there should be some examples right away, right? You don't have to click like 10 times to find a simple example. And here you have to scroll and click and scroll and click. And here it is, right? So this is the one I copied over here. So let's now see if this works. I run this package here, which is also loaded now. That was also installed. You get the same warning. I load the GG. Well, it's already loaded. And then I read some tree here. Let's see if this works. Yeah, Newick. Oh, that's really the name of a file. Uh, and then we read the tree from a file. That's an example tree, right? And then we can see if we can plot it. Oops. Not provided by RCPP. Okay, then we need to reinstall the RCPP package. Okay, so I reinstalled the RCPP package and then restarted again after I installed. So let's try this code yet again. Loading the tree IO package and the GG tree looks fine. Read the tree into R and let, let's see if we can plot now. Now it looks like we can actually plot a tree. This was not the prettiest tree I've seen, but at least it looks like it works now. So hopefully this was what we needed to make this GG tree package work on an old version of R. It might be that you experience something different and that this can be quite some hassle. So let's hope that we get a new version of R Studio soon. Then we can just use the newest version of R and everything should work fine.